Step four. So now, what we've done so far is we've looked at the system from an individual user's perspective, and we looked at their priorities and concerns and defined system capabilities. We're now going to raise the discussion just a little bit higher now and look at it from a higher system level view, which is the operations. How is the system operating, or how does how does the transit, transit authority want the system uh, to operate? So I broke this up into two broad categories. One is the yard and depot, because that is a, a separate entity on its own, and the mainline operations. If we start with the yard operations, uh, we have here our typical yard. It, uh, the blue is the yard uh, or the depot, and the green is your mainline operations. Now, usually many transit agencies, if not all of them, are, their organizations are broken up by mainline and the depot. And one of the common mistakes that uh, Excuse me. One of the common mistakes that some of these agencies will make is they'll say CBTC goes on the main line and the depot will remain conventional because it's a cost issue. But you can't approach it this way. A CBTC system needs to have control of as much part of the property as possible in order to be able to efficiently operate the system. And this applies to the yard as well. The CBTC system has to come into the yard to be able to launch these trains at the appointed time efficiently. If you have, if you have a human operator, uh, managing that, you'll get into some trouble. So the CBTC system has to, as a bare minimum, be able to control a hostel or the launch point where the trains will be launched from. The pink area is the CBTC control area. The blue is the, the uh, traditional or manual or the old signaling system that, that may be there. Um, and in this situation, the train, the storage lane, will be driven in manual to the hostler it would put it into a CBTC control mode, do its self-test, whatever may be necessary, and at the appointed time, the system would automatically launch that train into the, the main line. Uh, you may want to extend this further and say uh, the CBTC control area will be extended to the storage lane, which means in this scenario, the system would wake up the train, perform its self-test, move the train automatically to the hostler or the launch point, uh, and then uh, launch at the appointed time into the mainland. The point here is a discussion needs to take place by the authority and its, uh, and its people to determine how much control do you want the CBTC system uh, in, in to control in the yard. Uh, do you want it a bare minimum hostler? Do you want it partial or do you want it full? So it's a discussion that needs to take place because it is a cost uh, issue um, related to this decision. Now, mainline operations. For mainline operations, you first need to understand what type of patterns you're running on the system. It may be a single clockwise uh, loop. You may have a sub loop in there somewhere, depending on uh, the time of day. Maybe in rush hour, you need more trains in a certain part of the track, not so much in other parts of the track, so you have uh, uh, smaller patterns that need to be run. You need to understand your normal daily operations. And you also need to ask yourself the question, with CDTC in place, are there new patterns that you may want to run? Um, in which case you would define those so you can feed that into the technical specification in, in, in the future. You need to identify where are the pocket tracks. Um, these are locations on the track which you, a train will sit there and, at the, and if it's needed, it'll be launched into the system. In a CBTC application, this, become, this is a very critical piece of information. Uh, it needs to be able to memorize its location so when it powers down and powers up again, it knows where it is. Uh, because if this feature is not there and you power down that train, it's going to forget where it is and you have to re-enter the train, localize it, et cetera, which is a time-consuming task. So you have to identify these special locations on the track um, that, that exist for that particular property. You need to identify, uh, is the CBTC system going to run with equipped and unequipped trains or CBTC equipped trains and non-CBTC trains? Um, how do you handle that? Are you going to be able to uh, track that train by procedures? Are you going to implement secondary detection or fallback mode of operation? Or is there going to be a design in place in the CBTC to be able to protect that train? This is a very expensive decision. Uh, if you decide to go with secondary train detection, the complexity, the level of complexity that's added is exponential. Um, not to mention the fact that you have to maintain that fallback mode of operation. So it's, it's a discussion that needs to take place whether you really need secondary detection or not. Most systems don't, but many transit agencies, uh, it just gives them a sense of comfort uh, by adding a secondary train detection. But it's really a decision that should be based on a proper business case, not on a gut feel. Modes of operation. Uh, your system can take several modes. There's a normal mode, 
a fallback mode, a self-regulating mode. You can have a backup control center, several modes at a system level that, uh, that are applicable that the operator would have to make a decision on. The trains also have their modes, uh, typical or your automatic mode, uh, protected manual mode, manual mode, cutout mode. So you need to define what type of modes this system and the train are going to be operating within. Train recovery, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, how do you recover a failed train? To me, a failed train on the track is a remote possibility, meaning you lost communication with that train um, uh, and how do you recover it? Uh, if you're able to figure out how to recover a failed train in the system, uh, you can probably handle just about any failure that system may exhibit. Um, so, but how do you recover it? Do you use procedures? Do you use secondary train induction? Do you have a design in place to recover that train uh, um, by, by design? Uh, so it's a discussion that has to take place. Work zones, uh, you need to define uh, how automatic trains are going to move through a work zone. In a traditional system, you have a driver on board. Uh, it's identified that there is a work zone. You may have a blue light in place indicating that there are workers at track level. The driver will see that and they will slow the train down and move slowly through that area. But in a CBTC application where there may not be a driver on board, or even if there is, it's an automatic system. The driver may not be paying attention. How do you move a train through a work zone and protect your track workers at track level? Well, this is what the discussion that has to take place here. Are you going to be using procedures, manual procedures, or is there a design going to be in place? Does the automatic train come in, uh, slow down, and move slowly through the, uh, through the area, or does it stop, put into a, a, a manual mode, and the driver move the train through that area? Uh, is it going to be a vital function or a non-vital function? These are the discussions that have to take place. Many suppliers, at least what I've seen to date, um, have a work zone function that is heavy on procedures. Um, and the transit agencies really need to push the suppliers to make it more automatic, make it vital, uh, and safety uh, to, to make sure that their workers are protected at track level. So work zones is another operational topic that should happen. Work cars. Uh, work cars are, it's a topic that's, I find at least that's uh, not discussed properly uh, by many agencies. They just kind of assume work cars is an, more of an afterthought. Only when the project has started do they realize that work cars is a, is a critical topic. A work car is very different from a passenger train. A passenger train is consistent. Uh, it has the same length, let's say six cars. It has the same braking characteristics. It has the same acceleration curves. Um, every passenger train is the same from one train to the next. Uh, so a consistent set of rules and design principles can be applied. For a work car, it's very dynamic. It can be in any type of a configuration. Um, uh, you can have a ballast buggy attached to it. You can have a flatbed attached to it. You can have a crane attached to it. And it can be in various configurations. And each configuration brings its own braking curve with it, acceleration curve with it, stopping distance uh, attached to it. Uh, the length is different from one, one configuration to the next, so it becomes a very complicated design. Uh, and it needs to be decided whether uh, a work car is going to be equipped with CBDC equipment or not. And if it's not equipped, how do you track that work car at track level? Is it secondary train detection or is it by procedures uh, or not? If it's equipped, well, then it's treated like a passenger train, but it is complicated. So. Depending on the size of the work car fleet for the organization, the decision will be based on that. If it's maybe one or two work cars, you can get away with procedures. If you have 80 work cars, well, you probably need a design in place to be able to track this train at track level without interrupting revenue service. So it's a very critical decision. It's a very expensive decision um, because not only is it equipping the, the work cars with CVTC equipment, it's also deciding uh, whether that fleet can, is, is CVTC ready. If some parts of your work car fleet are not CBTC ready, you may need to decommission it and, and procure new work cars. Or maybe existing work cars need to be upgraded to, be, to make them CBTC ready. So it's a very expensive decision. Uh, the capital costs are very high. Um, so it's a very critical decision and the discussion has to take place upfront to know exactly uh, how, uh, how costly the system is going to be and what you need to do in order to be able to uh, control some of these work cars. So we've gone through this, the, the operations. Now step five is establishing